team is here. I will give everybody a few moments to introduce themselves. My name is Shelly Shasi Jandro. I'm the director supporting these wonderful individuals on the ESEA team. I'm Rita Polo. Um, my colleague, Jess Karen, is on maternity leave. She gave birth in July. She'll be back in October, and we are Title I. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Reed, and I am the Title II coordinator. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyra Corson, and I'm the fiscal coordinator, uh, reviewing all fiscal elements in the monitoring instrument. Hi, I'm Monique Sullivan, and I am the school improvement coordinator. And we do have two other colleagues on our team, Daniel Weeks, our Title III, Title V program coordinator, as well as Travis Dowdy, our Title IV and 21st Century program coordinator, who will be joining us throughout this process associated with FY25 monitoring. Essentially, our team as uh, ESEA is required to do all oversights of programs and activities, and monitoring is one of the items that we are gonna dig right into as it's under the purview of requirements for us. However, a few housekeeping items so that we can manage the questions, but also be sure that we're uh, efficient with our time. We wanted to let you know that this training is going to be recorded and is being recorded so that we can provide it as a resource on our website. We do encourage you to keep your microphone muted, muted throughout the presentation so that the, the sound is reduced and our recording is strong in regards to the audio features. We will be using the questions and answers section of Zoom. So participants can pose questions and then the department staff will be able to see it and respond accordingly. So there are a few options in Zoom, questions and answers tends to be under the three um, buttons, the three dots with the circle around it under more and that will allow you to get to questions and answers and pose any questions that you have associated with the material that we are presenting. In addition to the recording that we will make available on our website, we will also make available these slides. This slide deck has been available since the end of August. We wanted to be sure you had the content so that you could jump in and take a look to see if you had any specific questions while you joined us today this afternoon. Again, we will have a fair amount of documents and resources that we will share throughout the presentation that will also be housed on our website. One of the key features of today is doing a walkthrough towards the end. However, we want to do we want to cover material on the onset about the items associated with the monitoring docu documents that we have. As I mentioned, our ESEA team is required to do oversight and monitoring of all programs with any of the federal funds under the ESEA programs. We have designed protocols and procedures and our, our procedures align to the, the goals that we have as a program, but also uh, aligned to all the requirements under compliance-based work that we do as a federal programs team. As I mentioned, it adhered to state and federal laws and regulations. So anytime you have a question associated with why we're monitoring this item or where it is, there is some federal laws and regulations associated with the components of the work that we're doing under our FY25 monitoring process. We have adopted a consolidated monitoring um, process, which means we are looking at programmatic and fiscal and seeing the connection between the two, but also being sure that we're utilizing both platforms, programmatic and fiscal, to engage in conversation to be sure that programs are implementing appropriate federal and state laws. So we wanted to highlight a little bit for you in regards to how our selection tool is utilized. So there's 20 indicators on the monitoring selection tool and we run those 20 indicators for all SAUs annually. Some of the indicators include size and funding level, but in addition to staff turnover. And essentially these 20 indicators are identifying areas that potentially would create greater risk with use of federal funds. So we look at submission dates for the application and the performance report, 
We also look at approval dates of those two entities. We, in addition to the items that we mentioned, we take a look at single audits, any return funds, excess carryover funds, and those all sit in our fiscal oversight component and indicators within our selection tool. The SAU also has performance data that is generated from grants from me, and there's a handful of data points that we use from the information and the data that is generated from the application performance report and invoice submissions. So not to necessarily get into the weeds of how the selection tool is, because we really want to focus a lot of our time and energy on the items themselves that are being monitored. But essentially we download the data associated with the selection questions for the monitoring tool on an annual basis. There's data points associated with each indicator as well as point values associated with those indicators. And based on the number of points and the percentage within each item, whether it's fiscal or programmatic, we determine the level of support that is needed for SAUs, identified as low, medium, high support levels. And then overall, between the fiscal and the programmatic ratings, the higher of the two is selected in regards to the overall monitoring level base of support. So I alluded to low, medium, and high. And, and we just wanted to provide a little bit more information about those uh, tiers of support. So essentially low is monitored through evidence that is submitted on an annual basis that could include the invoice, the performance reports, as well as the application and ongoing um, conversations with your regional program manager. Medium has all the requirements outlined in the low level monitoring, but in addition to some additional items, and there's two submission windows this year, which is a change from last year, we will have a fall and a winter submission throughout the year. High level of support will be required to um, identify items for the, the low, medium, and high items. So you'll see, we'll talk a little bit more about each of those categories and what it entails in regards to the items associated in the fall and winter sessions. We also have the possibility this year to potentially visit on site. That is something that has been um, relinquished from the process in past years due to the pandemic. However, this is a requirement and a component of monitoring that you will see will return in the spring. All right, as Shelly has just alluded to, we do have some changes if you're with us for our FY24 monitoring cycle or if you were part of the pilot we did back in FY23. So in FY24, we had three collection windows. And for FY25, we've moved to two windows with a bit more time um, for the sort of back and forth that tends to happen as we go through corrective actions. So our two windows this year, fall window opened up on 9-1 with submissions due on 10-1. And our winter window has opened, or will open, I should say, on 2-1 and submissions will be due on 2-21. In FY24, there was a total of 33 items. In FY25, we are at 34, uh, with those being evenly split between the fall and the winter. And uh, as Shelly just mentioned, we have not done on-site visits in quite some time, but those are uh, essentially something that we will be doing with the SAUs who need that support this year. Some key considerations as we start to get into the weeds here in a minute on the various monitoring items. It's going to be very important to understand which programs and items are relevant to your SAU. So for example, you would wanna know which titles your SAU receives and keeps in that title. So if all of your Title II funds are transferred to Title I, the Title II monitoring items would not be applicable to your district because for all intents and purposes, you no longer have Title II. You've transferred them into Title I. 
You'd also want to make sure if you consult with any non-public schools to provide them with equitable services, which titles you're providing those equitable services for, because they may also need to provide some documentation to you to help prove they're meeting some of the requirements that we have here with monitoring. So it's going to be important to know what types of programs your SAU is facilitating. So if you're a Title I program, are you school-wide or are you providing a target assistance program? Are you providing a target assistance program at a non-public school? What is your status in Maine's model of school supports, tier one, tier two, or tier three? Are you providing any supplemental multilingual programming under Title I or Title III? Sort of having that background knowledge is what's gonna enable you to know which items here will apply to you and which ones are not applicable. And it's important for us to talk a little bit about what happens if monitoring is incomplete or is just not submitted. So first and foremost, if there is incomplete or non-submission of the monitoring instrument, there may be a formal letter issued to the SAU, including your superintendent, your SEA coordinator, your business manager. We may be placing a temporary hold on your access to ESEA funding until you complete those submissions. And that is one of the factors we'll consider when determining if we need to do an on-site visit in the spring. I could take these ESEA monitoring items. These are going to be, we're going to start going into what you need to submit. Um, this is general ESEA requirements. We just wanted to show folks there are certain um, items that are required that cross over uh, various titles. So they're not neatly in one title or the other. And we're going to quickly go through some of those items and what to expect for those items. So you'll see the fall collection window will We'll have a requirement for the ESEA application consultation. As folks know, these are really for folks receiving Title I, II, or IV, as it's very important to be consulting with the key stakeholders, students, parents, teachers, paraprofessionals, principals, administrators, um, and other stakeholders, um, school board members, et cetera. So you want to just make sure that this evidence that you submit provide shows um, that your uh, receiving feedback or gathering feedback from those stakeholder groups about your ESEA application. Um, this one is fairly self-explanatory. Um, however, I've seen evidence in various ways. This is an item that for those uh, as SAUs that have non-publics that participate in equitable services. Um, and so that ongoing consultation through email, through form, um, uh, logging phone calls, um, that will be the kinds of evidence that your as a public SAU with a non-public participating, that you have meaningful consultation in a timely way about high needs and services offered. Um, this one is really about prioritizing high needs schools. This again is for title, this is specific for title two II and four. Um, because those titles really are meant to target the highest need schools. Um, so for your well-rounded, your safe and healthy, which schools are you prioritizing for that funding and why? Um, and they, you'll provide data to corroborate that those selected schools have the greatest need for the PD and for those Title IV elements. And then this one, E5, is non-public procurement and payment. Um, of course, the money stays with the public SAU, um, but you're going to demonstrate that, that those procurement procedures are followed um, when working with the non-public. And so you can see that you'll demonstrate that the materials or equipment or property purchased with ESEA funds for a non-public school would be paid for and maintained by the public SAU, but that there is a process there for that. And this is a big one. <laughs> This is that you are regularly, annually updating your comprehensive needs assessment. This is a major requirement under ESEA and multiple titles and that you have your diverse group of stakeholders, that you're analyzing recent years of data to determine your goals and activities of what will meet the highest needs, your plan for your high quality instructional programming and any ongoing professional development. Um, we have a consolidated document in the state of Maine, so often that's the same document that districts use for their school-wide plans. Um, note that for school-wide, the 
major factor that doesn't exist in general CNA is student subgroup analysis. The subgroups um, in statute are special education students, students from major racial and ethnic groups, economically disadvantaged, and multilingual learners. So uh, evidence that data has been uh, disaggregated and looked at with various subgroups and that the highest need subgroups are being addressed with your activities, your methods, and your strategies to strengthen your academic programming. All right, I can talk about item C3 here. So statute in a number of places talks about professional development having to meet certain requirements. And section 8101, number 42, specifically defines professional development as something that is evidence-based and sustained, not standalone one day or short-term workshops. It has to be intensive, collaborative, job embedded, data-driven, and classroom-focused. Many of you have heard me repeat this definition before in our office hours. So this requirement that we're looking at for monitoring is for any schools that utilize Title IIA funds for PD and any schools that are identified under Maine's model of school support. So what we would look for you to provide is an example from one PD session that might have been held by an applicable school or district and the associated materials from that example. So handouts, agendas, uh, slideshows, notes, something that can kind of paint the picture of what was done during that professional development session. And that can then demonstrate that it does meet that definition. Okay, um, and I'm the lucky one with all the Title I uh, explanations for you folks. Take a look, fall, winter, you'll notice some trends. A lot of it has to do with family engagement. And then I did mention the school-wide plans that are looked at. Um, there's also a targeted assistance uh, program requirements. So it's those two major programs that we look at and a lot of sort of that minutia of family engagement because statute specifically calls out uh, various things such as the policy. So we'll get into those and I'll breeze through what is required out of those. Parents' right to know um, is a fairly self-explanatory one, but I've seen confusion with this previous year. What's really important is that within the first month of school, you have some way, whether it's in your handbook or your website or your welcome back letter, that you are notifying parents of their right to know. So you don't have to share all the information. What you're telling them is they have a right to know their teacher qualifications if they ask, and they also have a right to know your state local assessment policies and schedule and achievement of the student. So um, this, is, this is a letter that lets parents know of their rights as opposed to giving all the information. Part of this though, is that if you do have a teacher who is not qualified under the certification of what they're teaching, you have four weeks to notify um, the parents of those students. This one, you'll see they're both fall medium because sometimes a district actually makes this one letter, one notification, one, one web page that they give parents. Um, this is about the testing. So I mentioned that previously. This is also a right to know, and it's about testing um, and assessment policies. And we don't have opt out, so you don't need to specifically call out opt out. That one is if applicable in statute. Really, it's just to know who should they contact. Um, and that they have a right to understand this, the local assessment policies that the district has at any time. This one is more of the fiscal realm for us. This is understanding that folks with Title I funds are supplementing and not supplanting. What we look at uh, are budgets. And this one's really important to note that not this doesn't apply to everyone. Um, this does apply to Title I Part A recipients who are not Title I exempt. So if you only have one school per grade span, or if you only serve, um, if you're Title I neutral, you only serve one grade span and not a middle school, for instance, all your elementary schools are served with Title I, then you may be neutral. A good way to check if you're not sure is that actually every ESEA application, you have a page where you either check off that you are, or you do uh, explain the budgeting process. And this is that other monitoring item that says, all right, you let us know that you budget um, in an appropriate way. Now let's see that process with a little bit more narrative or a spreadsheet or template that expresses how local funds are given to the schools without the consideration of supplemental Title I funds. Uh, this is for our targeted assistance folks. Um, it's very important that target assistance statute is followed. 
that you have um, eligibility criteria that is objective, that you have a teacher who's working with these students um, and written narratives on their programming. Perhaps there's evidence of how they enter and exit. Um, really, this is to follow the targeted assistance requirements. Um, and so you would provide evidence that shows sort of how that targeted assistance program is running. Parent and family feedback is a big one. Like I mentioned earlier, Title I has a specific statutory section on family engagement um, and talks a lot about this opportunity for parents and families to provide feedback on the programming. So if it's a targeted program and that student has push in or pull out, what is that student experiencing? Are they improving? And so it's that kind of ability for parents to uh, suggest improvements or to have feedback with how the programs are going. For school-wide, this is any time that a school in a school-wide program is soliciting feedback from parents. Um, this could be surveys. This could be um, you have a, a parent advisory committee. Um, this could be on the website you uh, have a place where they can contact a certain administrator with their, uh, with their feedback. So it should be really transparent, really explicit that the uh, district and the schools are soliciting feedback on, parent, uh, on the programming of Title I. This one is um, for targeted, I should mention, parent parental notification of academic progress. For targeted, right, it's sort of how those targeted students receive their progress reports, probably different in that targeted program. For school-wide, often I see just progress reports or report cards. Um, recognize we don't need names of students. In fact, we shouldn't get any. Uh, so just templates of how uh, those are filled out or names redacted. Uh, can be helpful to understand, but really the gist here is that you notify parents on how the students are doing academically. Um, this one is also pretty general, but important. This is really just um, timely family communication, so that can look different. For targeted assistance program, it's understanding that the student has been identified for Title I and that understanding the schedule or what services they're going to receive how they do enter and exit those programs. For school-wide programs, it's how they communicate to all parents with important school and student updates, maybe testing uh, windows, um, maybe when the progress reports are available, when the family engagement nights are happening. Um, so really, I've seen a lot of evidence that varies, but yeah, it's exactly what sort of the title is that you are communicating with families in timely ways. The school parent compact is slightly more specific. Um, I have seen it embedded in policies. I've seen it in handbooks. I've seen it as specific letters. Just note um, that it's really important that that one is periodically updated and that you may ask for folks to provide any feedback, especially when moving from targeted to school-wide because some of that language might change. But really the compact should include shared responsibilities of school and parents and it describes the parent and teacher communications and expectations. Um, there are examples that I provide in some of the resources I'll share later. Um, that's always good to note and to kind of remember, do we update that? Do we look at that? Maybe a Title I annual family night or a family engagement night. It might be nice to have a station set up where folks look at the compact and suggest anything in addition to. <laughs> We're still going. <laughs> this is school level parent family involvement and activities. So this is the really, this is the crux, right? Does your school, your school-wide or targeted have a family engagement policy? It absolutely should. Um, and that policy also then should have activities outlined and there should be evidence of those activities happening. So if you are convening parent-teacher conferences, if your policy suggests certain activities that parents have or surveys they're able to fill out, we should then see samples of those surveys. Um, so it's really about sort of what does our policy say and how do we follow it? And that's what this, um, this particular item uh, is really about. All right, thank you, Rita. Uh, Title IIA specifically has a few less requirements than Title I Part A does, uh, but we do have two more monitoring items outside of the ones that apply across multiple programs for Title II, one in the fall and one in the winter. So our fall item is tied to class size reduction. And here, what statute points out is that there needs to be an evidence base for a class size reduction and that the teacher hired for that role needs to be considered effective. 
So this is an item that, as you might imagine, only applies to those who are using Title IIA funds for a class size reduction project. And what we need to see is some sort of narrative description of uh, the grade level and class size before and after the class size reduction teacher is hired, and then how that teacher was determined to be effective. So this is someone who was already in your district, who has moved into this role. You could maybe anonymize their um, teacher effectiveness rating that your district gives out every year. And if it's someone that you hired for this role, you'd want to either have some notes, again, anonymized in the interview process, or just a description of what in that process led you to determine they were an effective teacher. And the second item connects a bit back to what Rita talked about uh, for across ESEA programs and identifying needs. Specifically, this is tied to how we plan professional development and how the needs identified specifically for professional development have to then show up in the PD that's carried out. So this applies to any SAUs that are using Title IIA to pay for PD. And what we would wanna see is, first of all, the evidence of any sort of needs assessment tied to professional development. This might be connected just to the overall CNA process, or it might be something more specific. I know I've seen a lot of SAUs who do a PD needs assessment survey every year. And to go along with that, we'd want a list of the PD being provided by the districts in that either the coming school year or the previous school year, so that we can kind of draw some lines between the needs that are identified and the PD that's actually carried out. So you're seeing a trend, right? We've been through about 30 or so slides and you're seeing that we're kind of highlighting the components per title and our general items in the, the collection windows, but also in regards to the level associated with the support. So this title slide is associated with Title III, and there are a few requirements in regards to both collection windows for medium folks. And as you've noticed on the slides, there's a, a clear structure in which we've tried to identify within this training. So on the left-hand side, you'll always see the item number, which correlates directly to all the materials on our website, but in addition to the Grants for Me platform. So B8 is in regards to uh, ling uh, parent notification for multilingual status. And essentially, if you are operating a language instruction program provided with Title one A, Title A part, Title I Part A or Title III, then you want to be aware that you want to let your parents know the reason for identification, the proficiency level, and some other key indicators that we've provided here in the big takeaways. And this should transpire within 30 days of the beginning of the school year. Again, this is our fall medium support level collection item. B9 is also related to Title I Part A or Title III recipients who are providing language instruction programs. It is associated again with guardian information and outreach. And my apologies. Big takeaways here are really being sure that the material that is being sent out can be understood by the individuals you're sending it to. You must also indicate how the parents can be involved and the guardians can be involved in the education of their children, in addition to the amount of meetings and the regular meetings that will be held in regards to defining the instructional program for the students. A5, again, related to multilingual identification and exit procedures. The state as a whole has some information on our website, but individually, districts should also have information in regards to what are those procedures? What, how do you identify a multilingual learner and how does a multilingual learner exit the program? So again, following the state guidelines for exiting, which is on the website associated with the Office of Instruction and Support and our multilingual colleagues, uh, Jane Armstrong and Melanie Jenkins are a great resource as well as our Title III program specialist. Item C4 is related to professional development. Again, we wanna be sure that any district that receives Title III funds is aware that these activities must be defined as evidence-based, and they must also have the same notion that Title II does in regards to meeting a high need area that's 
identified in the work that you folks do with your comprehensive needs assessment. Thank you, Shelley. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the fiscal requirements have changed a bit this year. Last year, all fiscal elements was collected in the fall, which was a very daunting task. So hopefully by splitting these up, it will help you and myself um, process the items quicker. Um, the indication on the slide here, there is the fact sheets are all um, linked here beside each item number. E1 is financial management. It is a requirement under 2 CFR 200-302. And the big takeaways here is any SAU that receives ESCA federal funding or um, school improvement funds for a, a school within your district needs to maintain um, an accountant and a counting system that identifies each uh, grant and the expenditures. On the next screen, I have an example of what I look for when this is submitted. Now keep in mind that these uh, expenditure runs will be for the prior fiscal year. It's not gonna be for the current fiscal year. So for this upcoming um, monitoring season, uh, it's going to be 7123 to 63024. And in the red boxes on this slide, it clearly identifies which title um, the SAU is, is submitting, along with the fund number, which is recommended by um, DOE School Finance Department. Uh, fund 2300 is typically for Title I-A. Item E4 is time and effort. If you are using federal funds to um, pay the salaries, whether it be part in part or whole, time and effort documentation must be maintained. Time and effort documentation should be signed after the fact. And it is um, affirming time and effort, not how they are paid. So try not to put in there, I, Jane Doe, certify I am paid 100% with Title I, right? It, it needs to say, I, Jane Doe, spent 100% of my time engaged in Title I activities from, say, January 1st to uh, June 30th, 2024. And it needs to be signed after June 30th, 2024. E2, travel policy. This is a requirement under 2 CFR 200.475. Um, tra travel costs are the expenses for transportation, log lodging, yeah, login, get that right in there, uh, subsistence and related items incurred by employees who are in travel status. Uh, such costs can be charged on an actual cost basis or a per diem basis, or a combination of both. If the SAU does not have a travel policy, written travel reimbursement policy, then um, the reimbursement is based off of the government policy, which can be found at gsa.gov. E7, written procurement standards. This also is a regulation under 2 CFR. Um, big takeaways, if you use your federal ESEA funds to contract services or contract for commodities, um, you must have a document procurement procedure consistent with state, local, and tribal laws and regulations. So the subrecipient documented uh, procurement procedures must conform to the procurement standards identified in 
two CFR two hundred three seventeen through three twenty seven. E3 is also under the procurement standards, but it is testing your staff code of conduct when it comes to procuring contracted services. You must maintain written standards of conduct covering conflicts of interest and governing the actions of your employees engaged in the selection, award, and administration of contracts. Within this um, written procedures or, or policy, you must also um, provide disciplinary actions to be applied for violations of such standards by officers, employees, or agents of your organization. E6, equipment policy and procedures. Any equipment that is um, purchased using federal funds must be inventoried once a year. This has a uh, equipment is defined as having a useful life of more than one year, a per unit acquisition cost of over $5,000, and it will retain its original shape, appearance, and character with use. Keep in mind that all uh, equipment that is purchased using federal funds needs to be identified. So a sticker, um, on the equipment, identifying it as um, the uh, federal grant that purchased that particular equipment. This is an example of an equipment inventory checklist. Um, everybody should have some form of an equipment inventory. And this just uh, gives you the different things that should probably be listed on your equipment inventory checklist. And this can be found on our website. Hello, everyone. Um, and we have the school improvement requirements. Um, in the past, school improvement has not been a part of ESA monitoring. But as Shelley mentioned earlier, the US Department of Education wants us to monitor school improvement. And so this year we are adding that to the ESC consolidated monitoring. monitoring. Um, we don't have any fall collection items, uh, but we do have winter collection items. We'll have S1 and S2 um, for tier one ATSI and tier two CSI. I'm sorry, that should be TSI, not CSI. I'll make sure that gets fixed. Um, so S1, yeah, S1, is tier one, which is um, ATSI and for school improvement. And this is under section 1111. Um, and this actually falls under part 1A, the Title I Part A. So it is part of Title I Part A. Um, and this applies to any SU that has schools identified um, for tier three, or what we call outside of the 5%, or any schools that are identified as tier one or ATSI under Maine's model of school support, which we abbreviate as MMSS. SAUs that don't apply are for those that don't have any identified tier one or ATSI schools or any tier three schools, or they don't have any tier three schools that are uh, identified outside of the 5%. Um, Again, this is, um, oh, that's interesting. So it says window fall, high support. Um, and the big takeaways are um, these plans need to be developed in partnership with principal, other school leaders, teachers, and parents. And the plan needs to be able to show that those um, different stakeholders did have a part of the plan. It needs to be informed by all the indicators in Maine's model school support. And it needs to include a part of that is it needs to include also all of the, the student populations. Um, it needs to include one or more evidence-based intervention that is being used to address the areas of need and then identify resource inequities that are addressed to the implementation of the plan. And this is a big piece too, and that is it needs to be this, the ATSI school improvement plans are not, um, are not turned in to the main Department of Education. 
they are stay they stay at the school site and it is a responsibility of the SAU to review, approve, and monitor the plan and then make adjustments to the plan if it's not working. And there is a note at the bottom of the slide because a lot of schools already have, if you're already a Title I school-wide program, you already have a school-wide plan and you could use that plan as long as it meets all of these um, SI plan requirements. And that could also be the same for an SAU CNA. Again, if all the identified schools are included and the SI, the school improvement plan requirements are in that um, SAU CNA. Uh, the next one is um, S2, um, and this is for tier two or TSI school improvement plans. This also falls under section 1111, and this is for any school or any SAU that has a tier two identified school under Maine's model school supports. These schools were identified in May of 2023, and then it does not apply to SAUs with no tier two identified schools or TSI schools. Um, the big takeaways are, again, be developed in partnership with the principal and other leaders, teachers and parents, be informed by all the indicators in Maine's model school support, include at least one or more evidence-based interven interventions, and be reviewed and approved and monitored by the school and the SAU. And just like with the tier one or ATSI plans, you can always use your Title I school-wide program or your school-wide plan if you have one, if, you, if your school operates, if a school operates a Title I school-wide program or an SAU CNA can be used as long as it meets all the school improvement plan um, requirements. Great, just when we thought we were done with Title I, alas, there's more. Um, this, however, is not Title I Part A. This is Title I Part D. Uh, so I just want to note that I am fairly certain almost no SAUs on this particular call uh, have Title I Part D uh, funding, but I will go through very quickly uh, what they are to explain. This, again, is a grant for our adjudicated youth who live in the local or state residential, uh, local residential facilities or our state-run facility, Long Creek. Um, so we can... Uh, those programs, there's always has to be evaluation of progress uh, once at least every three years where you're looking at the student outcomes. Are they transitioning to post-secondary or employment? How are they doing in post-tests? And you disaggregate that data by race, gender, ethnicity. Again, this is really to understand that the Title I Part D programs for adjudicated youth um, are really meeting the uh, meet intent and purpose and really supporting those students um, as they transition. Uh, the residential facilities that we have, we have three in the state locally that receive Title I Part D Subpart 2, um, as well as our Long Creek Subpart 1 recipient. They have to demonstrate that their educational programming and curriculum is aligned to state standards. Uh, this is really the crux of Title I Part D because those students are living in residential facilities or at a correctional facility, the idea here that they're receiving the public and free education they are entitled to, and that, of course, there are transition services for students to continue education into CTE programs, employment, or any additional services such as counseling, um, and that they provide the evidence that they are doing this. And then, of course, parent and family involvement, because Title I really does, uh, does prioritize parent and family involvement. And because these students are in those facilities, this can be a difficult one, but we look for efforts um, and we look for communications that are broadly shared uh, with parents of students who may be living in these facilities. Um, <laughs> I love when resources exist online because I know we're all busy people and we're working odd hours and doing our best to continue to maintain our grants. Um, and comply with federal regulations. So just note that almost every fact sheet of every particular item, including the slide deck, in fact, for this training is all on our monitoring website. That is for full transparency and full support at any time. And you have your regional program managers to lean on when asking questions about items or the process. Um, Ryan will is about to take us into the instrument training. So um, just be aware that the guidance exists, the FAQ exists, and this training that will be recorded, that is recorded, is going to be on that webpage as well. 
So we know we've covered a lot of material in a very short period of time, kind of in a rapid fire fashion. But as Rita indicated, these resources are available for you on our website, as well as you have resources within the members of the ESEA team. So a couple things that we just want to highlight, highlight for you in regards to next steps and timeline is you can review the ESEA GAN within Grants for Me, but there's also a page within the monitoring instrument on Grants for Me that indicates the status in which the SAU has been identified. So you will be able to see if you are a low, medium, or high, and then take the necessary steps and actions once you've determined that level. ESEA monitoring instrument narrative responses and documents need to be uploaded. As we mentioned, those documents should be provided right in GEMS for me. You'll see that Ryan's gonna walk through the system and the portal with some examples here momentarily. But a reminder in regards to the fall window, you will already see that that is open on grants for me and all submissions are due by October 1st. We will provide feedback by November 1st so that you can make the particular next step and action items associated with the ESEA feedback. You are aware of the winter items because we've discussed them here in this training. They're also available off of our website. They're denoted in regards to each item and their a level of support, so medium or high. So you can already get a jump start in regards to that winter window. It will open on February 1st, and all of those items will be due by February 21st. We acknowledge that this is potentially through a February break, but again, we wanna make sure that you're aware of this information early, and we will remind you often in regards to that winter window for winter for your submission of your items. We will also be providing ESEA feedback by March 21st. And you can see that that timeline for the window in the winter is a little bit more consolidated than the one in the fall. And that is because we're implementing it and reinstating on-site visits, which will happen sometime after that March 21st feedback component. Again, we just wanna denote that we have some social media handles as a department. The reason why we have this slide here is because we're actually going to stop the recording because that's related to all of the content and all of the items associated with both Windows fall and winter for FY25's monitoring process. So if you folks bear with us for just a moment, we're gonna stop the recording and then we're gonna create a new recording so that there's a smaller uh, time-lapsed video for you to be able to go through the platform itself. So depending on your need, whether it's based on item documentation or the instrument itself, you'll be able to have two different resources to um, go in and take a look at. So bear with us for just a moment. 